welcome to another episode of CS350 Online. I'm your host, Leslie, and today's episode, we're going to do something that I forgot we needed to do. And that was we are going to talk about assignment three today, because I'm sure many of you are wanting to get started on that very final assignment so that you can move on to studying for, I'm sure, your numerous final assessments and exams, whatever your course is actually calling them. I'm just going to turn my camera here, bit it. So I apologize if this seems a little jarring. My kids are always up here playing with my tripods. There we go. All right, one other thing I'd like to mention at the beginning of this episode is that if you are watching live and you are finding the audio very quiet, please do let me know and I will crank the volume up on my mic a little bit more. I didn't want to turn it up all the way to start with because I didn't want to deafen anybody. All right. So first, let's talk about OS of the day. So today's OS is called Minix. And Minix was actually created in 1987 by a gentleman by the name of Andrew Tenenbaum. And you may be familiar with the name Tenenbaum because he has written one of the uh, more famous operating systems textbooks. Uh, funny side story is that um, When I, uh, when, when you start teaching the same course over and over and over again, the textbook publishers actually start to pick up on that. Like they are watching to see who teaches each topic at each school and they'll actually start sending you textbooks for free, hoping that you will set uh, your class textbook to be the one that they've sent you. So uh, the Tenenbaum textbook is one of the books that I got sent. So I now have this great big thick OS textbook, but no worries. I have no intent on switching your textbook to something that costs two or $300. I would much rather you have something that's freely available legally um, because there's no sense in you spending all that extra money. Uh, hope I have cranked the volume on the mic. So hopefully that's a little bit better. See if I can put it up anymore. I will crank it in OBS as well. Hopefully that's a little bit better for everybody. Sorry, this, I'm not used to actually having an external mic. So the fact that it even has a volume button is kind of weird. Um, all right. Anyways, back to Minix. So Minix is a, kind of an, an abbreviation for mini Unix. And, um, the idea behind it was that instead of having a monolithic operating system where everything and the kitchen sink could be in the kernel, you have a micro kernel instead. And the original kernel for Minix was actually just 12,000 lines of code, which I would like to point out, I believe is actually smaller than OS 161. Of course, OS 161 is also a monolithic operating system, which means that, well, everything is in the kernel for it. So inside of the Minix kernel, we originally had things like the file system, the memory manager, and all of things like that. But a lot of other things were actually not a part of that kernel. Now, one of the most interesting things about Minix is that it's kind of the, I want to say, one of the original operating systems that tried to be self-healing. Now, I'm sure many of you have encountered this in one way or another with your operating systems, is that... And, and for me, it was always Windows and the NVIDIA drivers. You'd be playing Warcraft 3 or you'd be playing Red Alert 2 or you'd be playing Unreal Tournament. I know they're all old games, but they're so much fun. Um, and all of a sudden, you'd get a blue screen of death because the driver for the NVIDIA card would crash. Now, unfortunately, that meant that your game crashed and that meant that the operating system crashed and that meant you actually had to restart your whole computer. And the idea behind self-healing is the fact that if a device driver crashes, that shouldn't necessarily mean that the operating system and the program crash. So what they wanted to be able to do in Minix is detect driver crashes and instead of killing the process, killing you know the OS, having a kernel panic and death, they wanted to say, okay, let's put the pro let's not kill anything just because the driver has died. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to pause the execution of the process and we're going to attempt to reload the driver 
And of course, in something, a Unix-based operating system, this is actually quite trivial to do. Um, of course, with Linux, all you would have to do is just type mod probe, and you could re restart a kernel module, which is restart a driver. So you could do something similar, except it, this would be detecting when the driver had failed, reload the driver, and hopefully continue the program from where you left off. So that's kind of an interesting thing, a self healing operating system. And the whole goal behind this was to make something that's reliable because ideally, if you're using a computer, like right now, I don't typically use Windows machines anymore. I have one here that I have Twitch open on, but I mean, I don't use Windows anymore. I pretty much only use Mac OS and, and GNU Linux based operating systems. I don't, because I write code and I do graphics and the, the those are the two operating systems that are really suited for those two things. But if I have, say, Photoshop open in Mac OS, I don't just have Photoshop open. I probably have Chrome open with like 20 tabs because that's how I remember what I'm doing. And then I probably also have 10 VI windows open. And I don't want, you know, a driver failure to cause my operating system to just reboot itself because I would lose everything else that I have open. So this ability to self heal is going to make your system a lot more reliable. So it's really cool. Now, a kind of a, an interesting story about Minix is that uh, it said that Linux Torvalds actually used Minix to create the Linux kernel. So, and there's apparently were some lawsuits at some point uh, indicating that, um, or at least suggesting that the Linux kernel stole its architecture uh, and a lot of the code from the Minix kernel. But my understanding is that even though there, this was the inspiration for a lot of how uh, the Linux kernel actually behaves, uh, the architecture and the code is actually different and it was an unfounded lawsuit. I mean, the Linux kernel and GNU Linux finds themselves under attack from various sources quite a bit. I don't know if you remember this, but there was this Unix company called SCO, which I don't even remember what it stood for. But in the early 2000s, like Slashdot was completely dominated by SCO is suing everybody. And it was constant, it was, it was absolutely silly. I don't think they won a single thing. I actually stopped going to Slashdot over the fact that there was like this four year period where it was just 100% SCO articles. Yeah, on Twitch, policy 71 in the real world. You just keep suing everybody. All right. So then, no recap today. We will rejoin and talk about the last section of devices and I/O, which is looking at um, the drivers for uh, a hard drive uh, in Thursday's episode. But I really want to make sure you get assignment three. And I know there's previous episodes, but you didn't pay all that money to watch episodes that already existed. So fresh episodes. All right. So if you are on Piazza, you will note that we actually have two sets of uh, assignment three slides posted. And uh, the newer set does actually contain a bit more information, but I am actually going to use the older set. And the reason I'm going to use the older set is because there's a few notes inside the new set, which only pertained to the winter of 2020s term. So I want to make sure that you don't um, fall into that. So first off, assignment three. This is where you are finally going to come back and you are going to solve the virtual memory in OS 161. And there are a lot of problems with it. So, I mean, one of the things that you are already aware of is that if you are testing something in OS 161, you can't run two programs back to back without rebooting the OS. Now, if this was a real operating system, nobody would use it because it's pointless. So, I mean, even DOS, like two, even DOS one, you didn't have to reboot DOS in between the programs. That That's silly. Um, <laughs> so, 
the reason why you can't run two programs back to back in OS 161 is because free doesn't actually do anything. And what happens is how OS 161 actually keeps track of how much memory has been used and how much memory is available is it has a pointer, like a single pointer that says, this is where you can find free memory. And every time you call kmalloc, it advances the pointer along. And every time you call kfree, nothing happens. So even though that memory before the pointer should technically be free and it does get set to dead beef or something around dead beef because this is where the pointer is and we don't move the pointer back that memory can never be used ever again so we have a really really crappy memory management system and we have no memory management at all and as a result we tend to run out of memory so we can't run programs back to back that is actually just one of the problems that plague OS 161's virtual memory system. Let's talk about some of the others. Did you know that if your TLB, remember that we are, even though OS 161 does segmentation, the actual uh, architecture is a paged MMU. And when its TLB is full, uh, instead of having the kernel actually choose somebody to evict, we kernel panic and die. So this is like you, one of your caches fill up and you get a blue screen of death. That's, that's not what should happen. And obviously we're going to need to fix that because that's not proper behavior. But I can tell you that fix, as we'll see momentarily, is pretty much like one or two lines of code and you should be able to do it in about five minutes. It's very trivial. Now, another problem that probably is not something you would have noticed, but is definitely a problem, is the fact that our text or code segment in OS 161's user programs is not read-only. And that means that a user program actually has the ability to overwrite constants and their program code while running. And as we all know, that's a very bad thing and we don't want that to happen. So you're going to need to fix that, but you're all, it's, it's two parts. You're going to need to make that segment read only, which is a fairly trivial task. It's only four or five lines of code to actually achieve that. But we have to make sure that when the user program does try to write to read only memory, that the kernel doesn't panic and die. Because if the user program tries to do something stupid, and user programs are always trying to do something stupid, but we want to make sure that the user program doesn't cause the kernel to blue screen of death. So we're going to need to fix that such that the user process terminates and not the operating system. And then, of course, we're going to want to fix the segmentation because OS 161, by using segmentation, has an external fragmentation problem. So we're going to want to repair that by combining segmentation with paging. Now, the reason why I'm using the older set of notes, even though they are a little less detailed, is because the newer set of notes, um, which I don't actually have the code to, uh, actually contains a line indicating that this final component about paging isn't required in the winter of 2020. That is only true for the winter of 2020. This is fall of 2020, and you are required to do the paging component. And I want to make that make you aware of that well in advance. Um, and I've actually made a note on Piazza indicating that you are expected to do that component. Okay, so we are going to talk about how to fix all these issues then. So first off, let's handle the easiest thing, and that's the uh, problem of the full TLB. And I apologize to those of you watching at home. You're probably noticing the lighting is kind of changing a little bit. Um, it's actually because my desk is actually sitting in front of this big six by six foot window and the sun keeps going behind the clouds. So I do have a light ring, but a light ring compared to the sun is pretty big difference. Power. <laughs> Anyways, so when do we notice that the TLB would be full? Well, it's actually not the MMU that notices that the TLB full because we have a software managed TLB. So that means that we are only going to notice that the TLB is full when we have a, um, a TLB miss. So when you have a TLB miss, it's going to you throw an exception. That exception is going to cause the kernel to run, and the kernel is going to run a handler known as VM fault. And VM fault's goal is to figure out what kind of fault is this and fix the problem. 
So inside of VM fault, after you figured out the fault address and what address it should translate to, we then try to insert that entry into the TLB. However, if you look at the code right now, if there is no free slot in the TLB, then what's going to happen is we throw a panic and we simply don't want to do that. What we want to do instead is choose a victim and evict them. Now, you might be thinking that you have to implement one of these crazy cash eviction strategies, and you don't. We have actually pre-selected and pre-implemented it. You just have to use it. And the function you need to use is called TLB random. And what TLB random is going to do is going to choose a random victim. Now you might be thinking this is a terrible cache eviction strategy. Actually, my understanding from studies from quite a few years ago is that it's actually a pretty decent strategy. It's not optimal, but on average, my understanding is TLB random actually performs pretty well. So you're just going to call TLB random and perform a random eviction. As I said, it's only like one or two lines of code. It's very, very simple. So this, and once you do that, you'll have no more panics on a full TLB. Right, you could do it right now. Then we want to move on to solving the problem of the read only code segment. Now this is actually a multi-part thing. So first off, one of the things that you're going to need to do is you're going to need to actually figure out is this address that I had a TLB miss on, is this a read-only address or not? And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to modify VM fault to have some kind of flag or indication that the fault address belongs to a read-only segment. And if that is true, then when you load that entry into the TLB, you need to make sure that you are setting the TLBLO dirty bit appropriately. And you, excuse me, will note, we actually have a little bit of code in the slides. And when we provide you with a little bit of code, that's usually a guidance as to say, hey, you should probably do this you should probably use this line of code. <laughs> All right, so if this is a read-only fault address, then make sure that when you are adding the TLB entry that you're setting the TLB LO dirty bit to the correct value, which is, says right here, load TLB entries for the code segment with this bit off. And that is going to make them read only, right? Now, how do you know which segment is supposed to be read only? Well, it corresponds to VBase and PBase 1. It's the code segment, the text segment, the first one. And all the code to figure out which um, segment the fault address is a part of is already there. So again, this is a modification to VM fault, and it's only a few lines of code. But it's not enough. Because if you do this and you go about and you try to test your code, what's going to happen is every user program you load is actually going to cause a panic and death due to the fact that you have tried to write to a read-only segment. And you're going to be like, but the program isn't loading. Like this is going to happen in load elf. And you're going to be sitting there wondering, why is it happening? Why is it throwing this exception in load elf? And the reason is because load elf is going to be filling the address space. So it's actually going to be loading the program data from the disk into the address space in memory, so in RAM. So load elf, which is a kernel privilege function, needs to be able to actually load the address space, which means that each time you try to load a page, you are going to be getting a TLB miss. And when you get that TLB miss, if you're in load elf and you're saying you can't write to the code segment, then you're not letting the kernel actually load the code segment initially into the address space. So here's the th trick. All the stuff we just talked about on the previous slide about how to set uh, TLBLO dirty to the correct value to prevent writing to 
a read-only address, um, that's only meaningful after load elf. Before load elf has completed, you don't want to set things to read only because you need to be able to actually populate the address space. So what you need to do is you should add some kind of flag or indicator to the address space itself to say, has a load elf completed? And then in VM fault, what you're going to do is you're going to check, is this address in a read only segment? Has load elf completed? And if those two things are true, then you would set that TLB entry to be read only. And if either of those is false, or one of those is false, then you wouldn't be setting it to read only. Now, there's a few other details. If, let's suppose, you run load elf, and now the address space is loaded. Because you actually populated the address space, your TLB is going to be full of TLB entries that correspond to the address space that you just loaded. But here's the problem. The dirty bit for all of those entries is set to read write. And if you then go back to user mode and the user pro program starts running, because there's no context switch going to happen, because we're actually running that program right now, the TLB will actually contain things that have invalid dirty bits. And so you would end up with the user program could end up writing to read-only memory. So what you need to do is immediately after load elf has completed, you want to clear the TLB because you want to make sure any of those entries that indicated that things were um, going to be read write when they should be read only for the user program, you want to make sure they're all cleared out. And the way that you clear out the TLB, of course, is by calling AS activate, which is the most horribly named function, of course, in all of OS 161. And it has nothing to do with activating anything. But there you go. So if you've done those two things, you will, oh, excuse me. If you've done those two things, you're still not quite done. Because here's the problem. Now suppose you do have a user program and it does try to write to read-only memory. Right now, OS 161 will panic and we want to stop that. And you actually, if you look in VM fault, you will see how that panic actually comes up. You want to stop it from panicking. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that when this exception is, re is discovered, don't panic. Instead, you need to actually make sure that we are returning a value from VM fault to MIPS trap to indicate that an error has occurred. And then inside of kill cur thread, instead of panicking, what we want to make sure is that we are going to kill the process instead of panicking. So we need to be returning error codes around such that kill cur thread will run. And in there, when you've detected that fault, which is what your pat the error code you're going to pass around, then what you're going to do is terminate the process. Now, how do you terminate the process in this sense? Well, actually, it's going to look just like sys exit, except that the exit code and exit status are going to be different. So there's two ways that you can kind of implement this. One way that you can implement this is you can actually modify sys exit itself to take an extra argument to indicate why is this process terminating? And then if you've got things like MK wait exit, you've got to actually um, add an if statement, like a branch to say, okay, well, if six exit was called because this is the system call, then we can call MK wait exit. But if sys exit is being called because uh, I'm killing this process, then instead of calling MK wait exit, there's like MK wait sig. There, there, there's a bunch of other ones. So you've got to make sure that you're setting up the exit code correct. It's actually a pretty small modification to sys exit, depending on your implementation. The other approach is to actually make like a sys kill or a sys terminate, and then um, kind of modeling it off of your sys exit and have it set up the code. We don't care what you do, just make it work. We don't 
want a right to read-only memory to cause the kernel to blue screen of death and die. We just want it to kill the process. So how you do that is up to you. All right. So these two changes here, by the way, they shouldn't take you very long. These are actually fairly straightforward changes. But now we need to actually talk about managing memory. So if this really bad rectangle is our picture of physical memory, we've got address zero down at the bottom. Oh, excuse me. When, you, when the kernel of the operating system is booting, what's going to happen is there is a function called get p pages which uses this function called ram steal map and that is actually going to steal some memory for the kernel to boot okay so it's going to steal some memory and right now what's interesting is all of the allocations called this ram steal mem either directly or indirectly and they are going to keep stealing memory and what you're going to see about ram steal map is it keeps it has a pointer to say where is memory free we don't want to do this this is bad so this memory for bootstrap which is before ver before we've really booted up the system that has to stay but once this bootstrap has taken place, we want to put in place a core map to actually manage the memory that is here so that we can actually free things when we need to free them and reuse memory. So I want to talk a little bit about core maps. So first off, after the memory for bootstrap, sorry, I'm just getting my pen out here. After the memory for bootstrap, what we're going to do is we actually want to, and you can see here in the picture, we want to divide logically all of the remaining physical memory into pages or frames. Because we want to be and doing things on a page basis. Um, because our architecture does paging, and even though our OS does segmentation, you will note that the segments are a contiguous block of pages. So we really want to be logically dividing physical memory into a bunch of pages. We'll talk about how that works in a second. But we, now we need to keep track of all these pages. So we want to build this core map. Now a core map is a structure, and you have ultimate flexibility in how you implement it. We really don't care what you do. And that's generally the rule in this course is we don't care what you do, just make it work. Just make it work. Apologize. You might from time to hear time here. Don't do that ever. It's just my son. It's his favorite thing to say. Okay. So what we've got is we've, we want to manage memory. So I want to keep track of each page, each frame of physical memory, and I want to know if it's in use or not. So our core map keeps track of all of the physical pages and whether they are in use or not. So you could kind of picture a core map as follows. So let's draw a core map. So let's draw. So we'll start, here's our core map. And um, well, I could have the page number. And then I could indicate using a bit whether it's in use. So we could have page 0, page 1, page 2, page 3, 4, 5, 6. Let's do seven pages here. So we could scroll, maybe. Let's 
It's like the worst program ever. <laughs> it's already crashed. Okay. So then we have this bit to indicate whether the page is in use or not. So you can imagine, okay, this page is free, this page is not free, this page is not free, free, like so. But we need more information than this because let's think about this for a minute. When you allocate some memory, do you say, okay, allocate me one page, allocate me, excuse me, one more page, give me one more, give me one more, give me one more. That's not how you do things. How you actually do things is you say, give me a contiguous block. And that contiguous block may actually correspond to several pages. And when you free, how, how do you free? Do you tell free how much memory to free or you just pass it an address? You just pass it an address, which means that what you need to do is you need to keep track of contiguous allocations in the core map because free doesn't indicate how much memory you should be freeing. Somehow the system needs to keep track of if you are freeing an address here that must correspond to this great big allocation. So in our core map, we keep track of contiguous allocations. So what that actually ends up looking like is, so you will say something like, um, So obviously this one is page zero of zero because it's free. But this allocation here, maybe this is a contiguous allocation. So let's say this one is contiguous. And then let's say these two are contiguous as well. So we would say this is page one of two and this is page two of two. And this is page one of two again and this is page two of two again. And then this is page one of one. So now when I come in and I try to free something, I can go into the core map and I see this address here corresponding to page one and I look at this data here and I say, okay, this was a contiguous allocation of pages and I will know to free both of those. So the idea behind a core map is when you want some memory, when you want a page of memory, you go to the core map and you're gonna look for free pages that map to whatever you are trying to, however many pages you're trying to get. And then you will take those pages. And then when you are freeing memory up, what you're going to do is you're going to come to the core map and you're going to look for, you're going to look for that particular entry that is in use and you'll free everything that corresponds to that contiguous allocation. If we were to implement our core map like this, we'd actually end up with a pretty big core map because we would be storing one, two, three integers plus a Boolean. So due to padding, that usually works out just to be four integers of space. So let's say that this was four ints of space. So per frame of memory, our core map is storing 128 bits. Okay, let me tell you a secret about assignment three. We want to prove definitively that you have implemented free correctly. And we don't wanna really do a lot of legwork for it. So there's actually a really easy way to do it. What we're going to do is we're gonna take your physical memory and instead of giving you, you know, two megs or one meg, we're gonna do this give you so little memory that the only way the process will run is if you actually have free running properly. So you wanna make sure that your core map, which actually has to live in RAM, is as small as possible. So having 128 bits be used for each of the core map entries may not necessarily be the best use of space. So I'd like to show you without as much explanation, an equivalent core map that stores significantly less data. Hey, the erase actually works. So I'm gonna do this one in green here. So 
So I'm going to keep track of a starting address. And then I am simply going to do, and this is going to be the same core map for the same memory that we see in the first one, so just stored differently. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Instead of storing four integers or 128 bits per core map entry, I'm storing a singular integer uh, for each core map entry. And then I'm also storing <clears throat> the address in physical memory of the start of the first page. <clears throat> the idea here, very quickly, is that if the core map entry is zero, it's free. If it's not zero, it's not free. Now, how do you find contiguous allocations? Well, look at this. The first address will actually have a one. The second core map entry will have a two. The third entry, if it was a part of a larger allocation, would be a three. If you are going traversing the core map, trying to free all of those pages a part of this contiguous allocation. And the next entry is not plus one of the current entry. Then you know it's not a part of that allocation. And so you stop. There you go. Much simpler core map. Again, I'm not going to explain any more than the bare minimum as to how that works. Do what you can. But the one thing I will say is this first approach that uses 128 bits per entry, I really don't recommend you do that because you are going to run into space problems. All right. So let's go back to this lovely slide here. So your core map is going to have one entry for each page and it's going to keep track of free, not free, and is this a part of a contiguous allocation? Where does the core map live though? Well, where you want the core map to live is you want the core map to actually live right tight up against the memory that was um, allocated for uh, bootstrap using steel map. Because you do not want the core map to track the memory used for the core map. The core map is going to exist from the boot process of the kernel to the end. So this is something you are going to create while the operating system is booting, and it is going to stay alive until the operating system shuts down. So you don't need to track that memory. So you need to make sure that the core map is tracking everything from above the core map. Now, how do you figure out how many frames you have? You're going to use this function called get size. Get size is going to figure out how much memory you have from the end of the bootstrap or the steel mem position to the end of physical memory. And then you divide that, of course, by the page size, and it will tell you how many frames are actually there. Then you need to figure out, well, how big does your core map need to be to store information for those frames, and then just subtract a little bit for the space where the core map would actually live. Do not track your core map in your core map. Make sure that the first frame the core map tracks is actually outside the core map, so above it. I mention this because I've seen many students with the problem of their core map is tracking their core map. And that's very, very bad because then you end up corrupting the core map usually, and we don't want that to happen. Now, another thing I want to say is when you perform the division, once you get, get use get size to figure out what the start and end of the free memory is, and you perform a subtraction, and then you perform a division by the page size, and you use that to calculate how many pages are available, there's one very important thing you have to keep in mind. The beginning of a page must be page aligned. So each page this first address, the zeroth address in each page must be divisible by the page size. And if it's not, the kernel is going to throw a panic saying this is not a multiple of page size. So make sure that you, when you're calculating the address of the first page, make sure that you add appropriate padding to um, make it align with the actual page, page into sizes. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to say, 
prior to the core map being created, RAM steel mem has to be used. Once the core map is created, RAM steel mem should never, ever, ever be used again. My recommendation is to have a flag in the system to indicate is the core map created or not. And my other recommendation is instead of doing all of these changes in alloc k pages. So this is what a lot of people do. So in order to use the core map and actually make sure you're getting memory from the core map instead of getting it from RAM steel map, um, in alloc k pages, people will actually call their core map search function. My recommendation to you though, is there are some functions in OS 161 that actually call get p pages directly. If you call get p pages directly, you would be calling RAM steel mem instead of your core map. And so you're going to have a big problem. So my recommendation is instead of modifying alloc k pages to do the search of the core map, modify get p pages to use RAM steel mem before the core map is available and use the core map after the core map is available. So make a big change to get P pages. That's my recommendation because then any of those quirky parts of the operating system, which are trying to use get P pages directly instead of the appropriate functions like alloc K pages, it'll work out a lot better. And there are, by the way, uh, functions in the address space um, that call get P pages instead of allocate pages. And so, I mean, you can modify it or you could just, you know, modify get P pages, which I would recommend just modify get P pages. Okay. So you've seen how to calculate the number of, or we've discussed very briefly how to calculate the number of pages. We've mentioned where the core map needs to go. How do you write this core map though? Before we talk about how you use the core map, how do you write it? Like, do you call malloc? to create the space for the core map? Do you create a structure with like fields? No, please don't. Please don't call K malloc because then you're just going to steal more memory. Here's the thing. When the operating system is booting, all memory belongs to the kernel. You don't have to ask for permission to use it. All you have to do is compute an address and write to it. So I know this is very weird because you're supposed to be mallocking things before you write to it. But when the kernel is booting, all memory belongs to the kernel. So the kernel can simply compute an address and write to it as long as the kernel keeps track of what it's doing, which is precisely what you are doing. So do not call malloc or kmalloc or anything like that for your core map. Simply compute the address and write to it. The memory is yours. You can do whatever you want with it. And um, where should you create your core map? Well, I recommend you take a look at the VM bootstrap function for a good place to start. Now, to order to actually use your uh, core map, there's a few functions you may need to modify. You don't have to modify them. It really depends on how you implement the core map, how you, like, it's completely up to you. but alloc k pages, you need to make sure that alloc k pages, which is what um, runs on behalf of k malloc, you need to make sure that alloc k pages one way or the other is acquiring memory from your core map and not from ram steel map. After you create your core map, ram steel map should never be called again. It's very bad if it gets called. So alloc k pages needs to use your core map. Free K pages also needs to use your core map because what free K pages is going to do is it's going to give you a virtual address and you need to actually find that virtual address in your core map and then free not only that page but any pages that belong to that contiguous allocation. So these two functions here you need to modify appropriately so that you are always going through the core map to get or free memory. And when you've done that, guess what? free works. It's actually not that hard to do, by the way. Okay. So is that the end of the assignment? I will say that up to that point, you can get 100% in the core or in the assignment. If you do everything that we've just talked about, you will pass 100% of our tests, but you will not get 100% on the assignment. Here's the thing. We can't test to make sure 
that uh, we can't test external fragmentation. The operating system isn't sophisticated enough yet for us to have a test for external fragmentation problems. So we are going on the system that the last part of the assignment, which is to solve external fragmentation, we're actually going to look at your code to see if you've done it. So the last part is to combine segmentation with paging and eliminate external fragmentation. So you already know what the address space looks like. You've got three segments, text, data, and stack. And if you actually look at how those three segments are currently allocated, they're allocated using alloc k pages, which gives you a contiguous block of frames i.e. a segment. And what we want to do is instead of getting a contiguous block of frames for the segment, I want to actually have paging for the segment. Now this is actually a really interesting combination of um, paging and segmentation. So one of the problems, I'm actually going to create a new page here. It's going to give me all this garbage, of course. Um, one of the problems with paging is if your address space actually, oh, that's a really bad rectangle. So let's say your address space looks like this, where the blue segments are the actual segments of the address space. If we do just paging on this address space, we're going to end up with a bunch of invalid entries. So this will be invalid, this will be invalid, these will all be invalid. So we end up with a page table that, even if it's a multi-level page table, we are still going to have a lot of entries which are invalid. If you combine segmentation with paging, so we're going to keep track of the segments. So we're still going to use segment math to figure out what segment does this address belong to. But once we figure out what address the segment or the, what segment the address belongs to, we're going to do paging inside. So the idea is we have a page table for this segment, we have a page table for this segment, and a page table for this segment. And they're separate page tables. But what's interesting about these page tables is because this page table only contains the pages for this segment, there are no invalid entries. So we don't even need a valid bit pretty neat, right? So we have three page tables, but the page tables are fixed. So like they have no invalid entries. It's pretty cool, right? I think it's pretty cool. So let's go back over here. What we want you to do is right now we've got in the address space, you know, V base one, P base one, and N pages. This P base one is used for segment math because it's the relocation value for that segment. And you need to replace this with the page table. So you need to have a page table for each of these segments. How you implement the page table is entirely up to you. How you assign page numbers is entirely up to you. I'm not giving you any hints to that. Once you, um, move to this phase, you're actually going to need to make a lot of changes in the operating system. One of them is AS create that's going to be used to initialize your address space data structures and ask yourself, is there anything I can initialize in AS create for my page tables? And actually, if you think about it, there's nothing you can not really much you can probably do here because you don't know how many how big the segments are. Then you have AS define region. So a region is the segment, and this is where you would actually be allocating the, the segment's memory. But now you could actually use it to allocate the memory for the page table, right? And then you can, um, you can do, so you'd be setting up the, the actual page table. Let's allocate the memory for the page table. And then in AS prepare load, where you actually load the data into that segment, that's where you should be allocating each of the frames for the address space and updating the page table so that you know that this page maps to this frame. So you're going to need to make modifications to AS define region and AS prepare load. Now there's one thing I want to say. We're going to be watching for this, or our TAs are going to be watching for this in your, because they are going to look at your code. If you call 
alloc k pages seven that gives you a contiguous region so this is a contiguous block of seven frames and we don't want that for this because if I have a segment and I want to use paging with that segment if I allocate that segment as seven contiguous frames then I still have segments and the page tables were meaningless what I want to do instead to ensure that my pages are scattering to the wind and preventing external fragmentation is I want to do something like this for I equals one to seven yes it's pseudocode oh well I'm gonna call alloc Okay, pages one. And then I'm gonna update that in the table. And doing this is not contiguous. And this is what we want for paging. So make sure you do that. Okay. Now, once you've actually created the page tables, you've allocated the memory for the segments, and you've updated the page table so that you have the page to frame mappings. Uh, you can also, you may need to make some changes to AS copy because before AS copy just did like a big mem copy. So now when you're actually doing this, you may actually need to make some changes to account for the fact that you're making a new address space and that you need to copy each of those physical frames over to um, the new address space and actually have two copies of them. So pay attention to AS copy. And I'm not saying you have to make changes. I'm saying, look, maybe you do need to make changes. The other one is AS destroy. AS destroy, in addition to freeing the actual segments themselves, so you're going to actually need to free each of the frames for each segment. And right now I think it's just, I'm actually not actually sure if AS destroy calls anything. Pay attention, AS destroy is a tricky one. Um, you have to free each of the pages of the segment, and then you have to free the page tables themselves. So make sure you are freeing everything. And this is where if you didn't free things in lock destroy, if you didn't free things in fork and wait PID appropriately, this is where it's all going to come back and bite you. So make sure that you've got free being called in appropriate places. Okay. Now, there are other changes that you will need to make to get paging working with your segments. I'm going to leave those as a mystery because I do want you to figure those out on your own. But needless to say, in order to determine whether you have implemented page tables and whether they are working, there are a couple places in the code that we can look and we will know instantly whether you've done it or not, regardless of your implementation. So on this assignment and this assignment only, we will be looking at your code. Now, a couple important notes. When you are using addresses in the kernel, remember that you should only ever be reading or writing a virtual address. You should never, ever try to read or write from a physical address. It's not to say you can't use physical addresses in computations. It's just you can't read or write from a physical address. You must convert it to a virtual address first. The reason why you cannot read or write from a physical address directly is because the MMU will not recognize it as being physical. The MMU translates every address, which means that if you pass it a physical address, the MMU is going to try to translate it and probably fail. So make sure that your reads and writes are always happening to virtual addresses. And there are some macros in the kernel to perform the translation. And you know that a kernel virtual address to physical is just this simple math here. You can add macros, you can add a function, it doesn't matter. The other thing is make sure you are not using kmalloc to allocate frames. You need to be using alloc k pages. So that's the end of the slides. But before the end of the episode, there's one more thing I want to show you. Aside from, you know, my 20 tabs that are open. So this is the marking. Chrome is being a pain here. Give it a minute to load.
such a pain, eh? All right, so you can bring this up on your own screen, of course. Um, but once once it's done loading, I will make it bigger. Um, this is the marking report for assignment three. And you'll note, as always, if you pass less than 50% of the tests, we will do a code inspection. Um, my experience with this course is that most students find this assignment a little bit easier than A2A. And that's certainly understandable because we're not dealing with a lot of threads with this one. So let's take a look at the tests that we do have. So there are two basic tests, VM data one and VM data three, that are run as basic tests to make sure that you know the TLB part works and so on. So that's five marks. Then to make sure that your read-only memory works, we've got these two tests here. So read-only memwrite and VM crash 2. And again, we're not going to tell you the correct output for these programs because you have the source code to all of these programs, so you can read it and see what we would expect. Then for testing whether or not you have physical memory or management working, so free working, we are going to run sort mat malt and VM data one with very little memory. And we're going to run things back to back. So some of these tests we will run on their own and then reboot your OS. And on other tests, we are going to actually run your programs back to back to back because we want to make sure that you actually got the memory management working. And that's only going to work if we run programs back to back. And if you're wondering how many times should you try before you're convinced that your memory management works, if you can run things like sort, map, malt, back to back like 20 or 30 times without problem, you're fine. Now, there are some, there are five marks for tests from previous assignments. So we are going to run wide fork and it's worth two marks. We are also going to run hog party and that's worth three marks. So if you do not have A2A or A2B working, don't panic. My recommendation to you, if you don't have A2A or A2B working at this point, um, is to go back to your A1 code and build A3 on A1. Because wide fork and hog party are only worth five marks. So it's not worth you losing a lot of marks. So it's just something to keep in mind. The other thing is if you didn't get argument passing working for A2B, don't worry because we don't have any argument passing on A3 because we're just running hog party. Now, you'll notice here the bottom thing, minus five marks if you don't have a page table. So what happens is let's suppose we test your code and you get 50 out of 50. The TAs are then going to manually go into your code and they are going to look for the page table implementation in the telltale spots. And it's very obvious to see if you have it or not. If it is there, you get 50 out of 50. If it is not there, you lose five marks. So you would get 45 out of 50. If you get 40 out of 50 on the tests and you do your page tables, then you get 40 out of 50. But if you did not do the page tables, then you would get 35. So whatever your score is, if you don't do the page tables, minus five marks. Now, a lot of students in the past, because it was just a five mark penalty, have elected not to do the page tables at all. And I certainly understand that decision and I'm not going to be judgmental about that. You do what works best for you. You've got four other courses, maybe more. They all have assignments done, so we're not going to judge you <laughs> on whether you decide to go for those five marks or not. It's up to you. You can, I can say this though, that it's important that you at least understand how the page table should work because we may ask theoretical questions like this on the final assessment. So even if you don't implement it, do make sure that you understand how it would be done. All right, so that is actually um, everything that you need to know about assignment three. It's not a lot of code, especially if, so the page tables is probably the most code, um, 
and everything leading up to the page tables is actually very small. Like I want to say you can probably do everything else in like 100 lines. Um, but the page tables, because of how much code you have to write and how many of the address space functions you have to modify, that's going to be where most of the code comes in. And um, another thing I want to mention about the testing of this assignment is we are only using one CPU. So you do not need to do multi CPU tests because we are not. Um, our implementation of virtual memory on this system doesn't really support multi cores. So we're not going to be doing that. So just one CPU for these tests. All right. Well, that is officially then everything to mention about assignment three, and uh, hopefully you have lots of fun with it. And if you do have the odd bug from A to A or A to B that you still want to work out, by all means, don't be afraid to post a question on Piazza. And if you need assistance with debugging, one of the things I want to say is I do know some people do uh, email me directly saying, hey, can we have a meeting to debug this? Um, the easiest way for me to help you debug your code is not having a phone call with you. And I'm honestly not trying to be rude. Um, the easiest way for me to help you debug is to actually just send me your code and a screenshot of your error. Because chances are, I have a good idea what the error is from the screenshot, and I can probably find problems in your code quite quickly um, and I don't need someone to explain it. Um, so the fastest way, and again, I'm really not trying to be rude. This is me trying to help you the best way possible. If you need help with debugging your code, send me an error of this, send a picture of the screenshot and the code or post that privately on Piazza. That is actually the easiest way to help you debug your code. Um, of course, if you have theoretical questions or some other thing, that's when it's probably better to do a, a, a meeting. So hopefully you are having a good November. I hear we're supposed to get some snow today. We will see you on Thursday where we will finish off our IO and devices section. And then next week, our episodes will be moving into file systems. Super exciting, right? All right. So we'll see you on Thursday. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I am no one. Okay, PC, what are you talking <laughs> Listen, friend, it's not very safe for me right now, you understand? There's a lot of spyware out there. It sneaks into your system, follows you wherever you may go. In uh, fact, take these. No, no, no. They'll keep you safe. PC, honestly, I don't need them. Really, I'm good. I run Mac OS X, so I don't have to worry about your spyware and viruses. You, you take them. Yeah, you're right. I probably should have a backup anyway. Yeah. You never saw me. Never saw who? Me, PC. Oh! Ugh.